it's neat to be able to draw Lewis structures to see how things bond and to draw three-dimensional structures that show how things are arranged in three-dimensional space. But in the hierarchy of things, we use those Lewis structures to get our three-dimensional structures so we can start talking about intermolecular forces and physical properties. It's a pretty big topic for us, and as I've said previously, like the more I've taught structures-based topics, the more I like them. And intermolecular forces has really been neat for me lately. Uh, I'll commonly abbreviate intermolecular forces IMF because it's a lot of things to write. You may also see them in textbooks and in other places as like van der Waals forces, van der Waals. Anyway, so if you see that terminology, um, that's where it's coming from. I'll use IMF almost every single time. I'm going to do something I don't normally do, and I'm just going to spoil it all in advance by giving you a ranking of the strengths of these intermolecular forces so we can get some background in how things work. So our first intermolecular force of interest, and this might be debatable, is ionic. And I'm going to go back over that with a darker yellow so we can actually see it. All right. So ionic forces are attractions among or between particles. And I think that depending on who you talk to, there may be some ambiguity as to whether you would technically count it as an intermolecular force, but I'm perfectly comfortable doing so. And it turns out that in the scale of things, ionic are much stronger than, if you haven't seen that notation before, two greater than signs means much greater than. Ionic forces are much greater than our next strongest, which are hydrogen bonding. And we'll talk about these definitions in a moment here. And those are greater than, in general, regular old dipole-dipole forces. And then we can put down London dispersion forces. And I'm going to be careful how I write this here. We have London dispersion forces as uh, weaker than, stronger than, or equal to London dispersion forces. I didn't write forces over here. All right, so that's the basis of what we need to cover. We need to discuss these different types of intermolecular forces and how they affect physical properties. I'm actually going to uh, box that in because I think that's useful information to have at hand for later discussions. So we didn't discuss the idea of an intermolecular force and a definition. Let's hop right to that. <clears throat> what is an intermolecular force? versus, we'll say, an intramolecular force. And so I'm going to write these things out. Intramolecular force versus an intermolecular force. All right, and again, that is our key distinction. And so commonly in like high school and health class or psychology or whatever, you'll talk about intra versus interpersonal communication. Um, and, or maybe like sports, you could say you have intramurals and no one ever says intermurals. But a lot of times people know intramurals are when you have competitions within the same school or intrapersonal communication is kind of your internal dialogue. Whereas interpersonal communication would be you communicating with other people, or intermural sports, which would be between other schools. So we've got that basic idea right there, and that's what we can use to get our definitions. An intramolecular force would be some force within a molecular compound. And I'm just going to put molecule there. And so we've already got a name for those, and we've spent quite a bit of time talking about it. We call those covalent bonds, all right? So generally, you're not going to see this terminology intramolecular force, but I think it's important if we're going to use intermolecular force for us to look at the parallel term. Intermolecular force, and these can be attraction or repulsion, um, but I'm just going to focus on attractions here. You have these forces of attraction, repulsion, among particles, and I'll just Specifically, we'll say molecules. So the key distinction is when you have things bonded together, they are attached. 
And when you have intermolecular forces, you're talking about how in two independent entities interact with each other, like two water molecules, for instance. And we'll go way more into detail than you want in a little bit. Generally, when people talk about intramolecular forces, they're talking about, or they'll list it out as three, which would be dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, and London dispersion, or just dispersion forces. Um, since hydrogen bonding is really a subcategory of dipole-dipole, I joke that it's really two and a half types of intramolecular force. But regardless, <clears throat> let's take a look at the specific ones. All right, our first one that we'll look at is a dipole-dipole force. And uh, I abbreviate that D-D, -D, saves a lot of writing. That may not be a super legit science abbreviation, but it is one that saves me a fair bit of time. So dipole-dipole forces, what are we talking about? And in class, I would ask my kids, um, like, what do you have to have in order to have dipole-dipole forces? And hopefully they would catch on to that and say, oh, you need a dipole. And what else do you need? Oh, you, you need another dipole. So we'll address that terminology. It's something we've seen in another video. But this is some force, and we're talking about this idea among particles, right? So this is a force among particles, right? Not within, but among the particles due to dipole interactions. squeezed it in, hopefully it's still on the camera there, dipole interactions. We've, we've used this terminology before, and I don't want you to overthink this, you just have to have two or more things that have net dipoles, all right? So let's jump back on our terminology very quickly. The idea of polar was uneven, right? And so if we have a polar bond, I'm having marker color issues over here, so a polar bond if a bond for covalent purposes is shearing of electrons, uh, then you can have uneven shearing of electrons, right? All right, and we can talk about this in terms of also uneven charge distribution. And we also had the idea of polar, or nonpolar rather, which is when you have some equal charge distribution. And that is also a term that we want to have clear and ready, so nonpolar. Something is nonpolar, we have equal sharing of electrons or a uniform charge distribution. All right, equal electron sharing, or we can say uniform charge distribution. And below polar, we want to, I guess, sneak in this other vocabulary term here, which would be a dipole. All right, and a dipole is when you have two opposite ends, the dia for two. And we've labeled these before in our Lewis structures with like deltas, right? So we've got slightly positive or slightly negative with our delta notation. and. We've also seen it with the arrow, where we would have an arrow pointing from the slightly positive end to the slightly negative end. So those notations are going to come into play as we work our way through three-dimensional structures. We've already used the deltas for our Lewis structures and things. And it turns out that net dipoles, which are often represented with an arrow, are going to be a huge deal for us. All right? The idea of something being nonpolar or something having a dipole, when we're talking about dipole-dipole forces, Coulomb's law opposites attract here, and when we have these partial dipoles, that's what's going to cause the particles to interact. There are two examples I always use for dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonding, um, and I want to compare those on the same sheet, so I'm not going to do that right here. What I'll do instead is look at an alternate example, and we'll look at something like how HCl, hydrochloric acid, how those particles would interact, you know, say in gas phase or whatever. If we draw the Lewis structure out, and in this particular case, I do want to be careful, Lewis structures are not an indication of intramolecular forces, they're not an indication of polarity, because they aren't locked into specific geometries. The molecular geometry is what really tells us uh, polarity, but in the situation where you only have two things, the Lewis structure is the same as the 3D structure. So just clarification in advance, it's going to look like the Lewis structure, but it also happens to be the 
uh, molecular geometry as well. HCl dot 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 dot. All right. As you look at it, we've talked about the idea of bond polarity, and we can predict bond polarity, slight positives and slight negatives, by looking at electronegativities. And you can grab those off of your periodic table or wherever. This periodic table happens to have them in the corner. So for hydrogen, we've got 2.1, and for chlorine, we've got 3.0. So this is a 2.1 versus 3.0. What does that mean? That mean chlor means chlorine is stronger in this tug of war over electrons, and the electrons are going to be closer to the chlorine. And the reason that matters is because electrons are negative. So if chlorine is stronger in the tug of war, it pulls those electrons, those negative charges, closer to it, and it starts to get a little bit negative, all right? Not ionic negative, just a little bit negative. Whereas the hydrogen has been distanced from those electrons, those negative charges, it, in, it ends up slightly positive, all right? So that's how we're labeling our individual dipoles in this case. Now this one, we could also label our net dipole with an arrow from the H to the CL, but I don't wanna make this picture any <clears throat> muddier than it is. So now let's look at what happens if we have another HCl floating around. And it doesn't really matter orientation here, but just say I have HCl with our dots. And we know still that this H, just like this H, is going to be slightly positive, and this chlorine is going to be slightly negative. And what you notice is, here is a particle, and here is a particle. This particle has a slightly negative end. This particle has a slightly positive end. And what you're going to end up with is some interaction right there a coulombic interaction, and that is an attraction. It's not a bond, right? An intermolecular force we're not treating as a bond, but it's an interaction among the particles. So I'll try and fill that in. This is an intermolecular attraction. In fact, in this case, I'll write dipole, dipole attraction. And I do want to clarify, it's not a bond, right? So we're not making a compound that is two H's and two CL's. We have two independent entities, two molecules that are attracted to each other because of the opposite dipoles on those ends. And that would go on for as many HCL's as you wanted to draw in here, however you wanted to draw them. So you could put like your chlorine with an H and you got some dots. And again, this chlorine is going to be slightly negative. It's pulling the electrons in that bond closer and this hydrogen is going to end up slightly positive. And we end up, again, with an attraction here, not an actual bond. And I'll draw in one more, just because I feel like that would be great. So we'll put in our H and our Cl. Make sure we have those non-bonding electrons on there. We do know that's a slight positive and a slight negative. And then the positives and negatives, opposites attract. So we're going to get this attraction right here. What this does in the big picture is it determines how far apart particles are in three-dimensional space, which is what determines largely phase at a given temperature, right? The fundamental difference between solid, liquid, and gas is distance between the particles. And the closer together those particles are, the stronger the force of attraction, the more energy it takes to spread them apart. So you end up with something with strong intermolecular forces more likely to be a solid at a given temperature because the particles are strongly attracted and pulled closer versus something like nitrogen gas at room temperature, which is nonpolar, there's a weaker attraction and those particles are farther apart. They end up as a gas at room temperature. All right, so we've got our first one, one of three or one of 2.5, and we're going to talk about hydrogen bonding, which is really a subcategory of this next.